Bueno, esto se acaba. Okay, well, this is coming to an end. Well, like uh, everything in life, and we've we have uh, lots of people connected. We've had seventeen uh, hundred incursions into the platform. And we're going to be finishing off with a very special key lecture. And I would like to warn you people that are connected online and to those people that are here in the auditorium that this is not going to leave anybody indifferent. I would like to introduce Maria Calvo Charro. Well, perhaps not many of you people know this lady. And above all, she's the mother of four children, and she's very proud of that. And she's a tenured professor at the Carlos III University in the area of administrative law. And she's a guest visiting professor, professor at Harvard. She's also been a visiting professor at Williamsbrook University in Virginia. And she's the chairperson in Spain of the European Association of Single-Sex Education. She's uh, written lots of monographic papers on legal issues and social issues, but in recent years she has uh, felt, uh, well, I don't know, um, that she's been called upon to talk about the family, about equality, and about something that is a hot topic, and which has to do with femininity and masculinity. And I'd just like to point out some of the issues that are related to her presentation. She's already published lots of things, stolen motherhood and education in the 21st century, dethroned uh, parents, uh, differentiated or differential um, education, or stolen masculinity. And at, when we were in the preparative stages, we thought that we thought that it would be a wonderful way to, to, to finish. And, well, we also discussed, well, we didn't discuss, let's say that we um, made some, we mentioned the possible titles. And she chose one that I fell in love with immediately that says the following. It says, uh, femininity and happiness uh, that is breaking the code. So with you now, we have Maria Calvo, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for staying on board, and many thanks to the universities that have organized uh, this necessary seminar. Many thanks to Luis, too, for this uh, lovely introduction, and uh, I don't deserve that at all. And uh, this uh, now I feel even more pressured. Well, femininity and happiness and uh, breaking the code, well, yes. In 2014, two major technological companies like uh, Facebook that everybody knows, uh, Facebook and Google, they made a very peculiar offer to their workers. It uh, consisted in offering them the possibility of uh, freezing their ovules. Well, that was very peculiar, and it was an obscene offer to uh, freeze their oversights because under the banner of uh, freedom and feminism and modernity, what uh, they hide, what they're hiding there is that they have full um, availability to work. In other words, it was professional slavery by pointing out that uh, motherhood was an obstacle for personal development and that motherhood is also equivalent to uh, tyranny. As uh, they said in, the in 1968, the tyranny of procreation and that you could wait for a better time to have children or to become a mother. But as the it was said in Ecclesiastes in the book, there's a moment for everything and there's a moment to become a mother. And this is something that the body of women know perfectly well, as we've seen in this uh, symposium. And this is also known by the minds of women. However, it is equally true that we're living in a moment of hypermodernity and which is characterized by paradoxes or by contradictions. And one of them is happens to be this one. When women, when women have generative capacity, when women are young, they are, well, they stick to a certain ideal, rejecting motherhood. And when they don't have generative capacity, they want to become mothers, and even against nature, because this is what the techniques allows them, and so does law. And in such a manner that we are facing this contradiction or this paradox that hides other dichotomies, let's say, such as the difference between the child that is uh, fostered and the child that is sought after, with uh, a big difference between the child as a byproduct of the love of two, of the love of its parents, as an effect of the metaphor of love, 
as something contingent or as the child as a direct product of the self-referential and narcissistic mother of the mother. So there's a difference between love and desire. As Bauman says in his uh, work, it's something completely different because love is centrifugal. It releases whilst uh, desire is centripede and it could produce a certain amount of slavery. So we are experiencing or have been experiencing a deculturalization of motherhood. And I've heard Eric Goodman talk about the deculturalization of fatherhood. It's something that has been addressed a lot. But what I thought is that we are also experiencing a deculturalization of motherhood. What does it mean to be a mother nowadays? And this uh, could uh, take us to the big question of the 21st century, who am I? And uh, which is uh, the most uh, present emotional hell in society. So we've always resorted to religion and uh, resorted to our family. The family gave us roots, and the family allowed us to know where we came from and also our history. And religion at least allowed us to know us to know who we are. We are the sons and daughters of God. But not only that, we have, uh, let's say, modified our symbolic codes We've changed the symbolic codes. There's been an anthropological mutation, and the concept of human being is uh, completely different. A new metaphysics has been established, a new ethics that has um, destroyed um, lots of our Western civilization, uh, the foundations of our civilization. It's destroyed the Judeo-Christian civilization. The problem is that if God doesn't exist, as Dostoevsky said, everything goes, as we've seen in recent years. And the use of reason has been eliminated, and we jurists can see this in the most recent laws. And uh, reason has been uh, substituted by feelings, emotions, and desires. And let's say that we have eliminated Plato, Aristoteles, and Kant, and Descartes. So it's now don't dare to think it's all about dare to feel. So we've eliminated reason, too, from law. And now law is not like uh, St. Thomas said, the use of uh, reason to achieve a common goal or common good. Now my desire is the law. What I feel, what I desire, what um, I find is exciting. And this is what is legally correct. So if we were to eliminate reason, mm, the truth is that we would be eliminating the basis of uh, Western civilization because right now freedom is uh, like uh, letting loose the basic uh, instincts of human sexuality. And as Freud said, uh, civilization starts off with uh, controlling our impulses. But if we leave our impulses completely free, it means that we're going back to the caves. We are abandoning our tribe. We are becoming animals because uh, we, you know that rationale or rationality is something that has to do with our essence. And when this happens, you become weaker, you become fragile, and the fragile, the most fragile element are women. But we've arrived after a historic process in which the 68 revolution had a very big importance, a historic process in which the 1968 revolution did have gains too. And it did have its positive side of things. We women are currently very empowered. We are living the time of women. And in the public sphere, we are successful women. And we have a report from the OECD that says that Spain in 2021, well, the high qualification positions are more occupied by women than men. So let's stop being victims. We don't need to have any quotas or anything like that. But it's funny, because if you observe this information, you can see that most of women are in the healthcare uh, field and uh, in the educational field. So we're looking for those fields where we can develop what Yuka Bulgaf uh, mentioned as the ethics of care or John Paul II, John Paul II that uh, feminine gender that makes us uh, personalize these situations even at work. But the 1968 revolution also had nevitic aspects and there were losses that people hardly talk about. And in this revolution, women mm, stop asking for equality in rights and duties relative to men and they ask for the functional equality of the sexes so they wanted to have equal rights in reproduction and fertility they didn't want to be mothers they wanted not to have children like men and that's why what became widespread was uh, contraception and abortion the so-called sexual liberation was all about separating sex from effectivity, from commitment, from reproduction, and of leaving um, sex as if it were a game, as if it was something merely physiological. 
And this liberation between inverted commas was a new feminine slavery because it represented the full availability. We spoke about full professional availability, but it was full availability. And in this case, it was sexual availability of women. So it was a new kind of slavery that was far away from that liberation that somebody spoke about. And it also, what also started, although this is currently very solid, what we did is identify men and women as regards their sexuality. In other words, the total and radical um, denial of this, these differences in the human beings, that is the existence of femininity and masculinity in the field of sexuality. So considering that women have the same sexuality, identical to that of men, enslaves us, degrades us and also is uh, misleads us because uh, we believe that women are more sexually liberated than ever, but they're more vulnerable in the field of sexuality. And they've also had more sexual experiences than ever, but they don't really know themselves. They don't even know their own rhythms, their hormonal rhythms, in such a manner that the consequences of this uh, revolution of 1968 were extensively and prophetically um, foreseen by uh, St. Paul VI in his encyclical Humane Vitae, and we're seeing this nowadays, because now the, well, there's confusion in our society, and there's lots of immaturity too, especially in the field of reproduction and sexuality. A revolution that uh, was supposed to be collectivist, that established individualism in its purest state, and uh, sentenced women to become completely lonely. And although the blame has always put on patriarchy, the truth is that the worst ill treatment that has been applied to women, or the worst situation that a woman can come across, or the biggest enemy of women, is the absence of of uh, family ties, stable family ties. These circumstances has had its consequences, as uh, John Paul II uh, um, predicted, or Paul, Paul, VI, Paul VI, but there have also been psychic consequences because of the, the character, the omnipotent um, character of uh, women with abortion and contraception. Marolina Cediotti, a psychoanalyst, uh, spoke to us about uh, psychic difficulties and Maximo Recalcati, he talks uh, more crudely about uh, pathological declinations. And uh, what I don't want to do, or what I would like to do is, uh, well, say something here in brackets, as it were, it's an aside, as an aside, and I'm not accusing uh, women uh, in relation to what I'm about to say, but rather what I am doing is uh, describing the ill treatment they are subjected to. I'm not uh, testifying against them, but the opposite. I'm here to defend them. I'm testifying in their favor. And women with uh, abortion and contraception acquire a power that is absolutely overwhelming of bringing life into life or not bringing life into this world. So this life depends only on their willpower. So in other words, they have the possibility of transforming the earth because as Massimo Recalcati said, the generation of a new life is a, return, is a transformation of the world. The world is never the same thing after we generate a new life. So in other words, this is an absolutely tremendous amount of power for the women. You decide whether you are going to bring life or not, or if you're going to bring death by acquiring well, or by um, suffering a, a fracture, an insurmountable fracture in the heart of femininity. And this is what abortion is all about. And uh, if you decide to bring life along, you decide when to bring a life along with or without generative capacity, how you want to do that with sex or without sex. So that's why uh, coitus is not necessary to have children nowadays with or without love, with or without the body because you can do without the body. You can resort to surrogate mothers, which is one of the biggest uh, slaveries of the 21st century. It's a new slavery for women, orthogenesis. Or you can decide to uh, have children with or without a father. And this is one of the issues that we could um, focus on. We could have a whole international symposium on that. That is the lack of a father, the hunger for a father, which is one of the worst evils we have in developed countries. 25 million killed 
kids um, don't know their biological fathers in the United States, and that is uh, more than Alzheimer and cancer patients put together. We are genealogical beings. We have a memory. We have a history. We need roots. We need a history. We need memory. And parents, the parents are the theologian. Let's say they are the book of our lives in such a manner that this um, overwhelming responsibility that is taken on board by women has psychological effects, of course. It has a psychic consequences, and this produces anxiety. It's logical for that to happen in view of, uh, in view of this overwhelming responsibility of bringing into the world a new planned life, something that has been programmed and sought after and that has a name. And this mother means that this child becomes the reason for her existence. In other words, it becomes the axis around which uh, her life uh, revolves, and it becomes a synergistic and symbiotic relationship. She is not able of um, delivering that experience of her absence and uh, the lack of attachment. So as I say, there's a synergistic and symbiotic relationship, something that kills the relationship because the womb is very comfortable, but it uh, has lots of limitations. And in this case, we have the problem that says that the donation instinct of the mother could become possession very easily. The mother, the relationship with the mother is essential. But we know that it cannot be exclusive. And we know that the mother, in this case, instead of generating life, she can become a mortal trap. Why a mortal trap or a fatal trap? Well, because that child is born under the ghost of the appropriation of the mother. In other words, that child is not born in freedom because the child is born under the power of the mother. It's born incarcerated or it's enslaved by the mother's desi desires with a predetermined future. And it has to give a meaning to the existence of the mother and has to meet the mother's expectations too in such a manner that that son does not acquire freedom, that uh, son does not acquire autonomy. And this child that is so desired, and this uh, sought-after child, is a child that reaches the top of the hierarchy. In other words, the affiliation is changed. It becomes the king child, what has been called uh, the worshipping of uh, babies, and uh, they know nothing about uh, the families. This uh, child is, has no limits and is not frustrated. Frustration, which is one of the fundamental rights uh, for the children, or, well, sometimes when we're lacking things, we can perceive ourselves as living human beings. And this child that knows nothing about frustration and knows nothing about limits, this uh, tiny king, this uh, tyrant, is uh, this omnipotency produces lots of insecurity because he's not ready for that. And he lives in the limbo of an unreal life. And he lives in a sort of invisible um, prison of psychological immaturity, and psychic breastfeeding babies, say psychiatrists, because it's these anxiety, what we've spoken about the mother, that generates this immense responsibility on the capable of giving life or on the decision of bringing life into the world and transforming the face of the earth. And this insecurity of the king child that is uh, not limited and not frustrated, well, this could eventually be somatized. Aldo Naudi, a great pediatrician, from Paris, uh, born in Algeria, with more than 60 years of experience, says that what he discovered in the 70s, or as from the 70s, what he called the so-called reflux generation. And uh, this, uh, what uh, he saw in the children is that there was a constant uh, element, a clinical element, and that is that children were anxious, they were stressed out, and children with refluxes, children with stomach problems, children that couldn't sleep. And he discussed this with his colleagues, and he came to a conclusion this was something that was pretty extended. And what in the early 70s had been, well, I don't know, three out of every 10 kids turned out to be nine approximately out of every 10 kids. And in the number of studies that he carried out, he noticed that this uh, didn't have to do with the breastfeeding, it didn't have to do with the delivery or with the family structure, and he eventually noticed that, yes, it did have to do, in most instances, had to do with um, middle class or high class women, but when it, it didn't happen in traditional families or immigrant families where values like religion, for instance, was a very determining factor. And she noticed that contraception, he noticed that contraception, this power of deciding on life, yes or no to life, when and how and well, had been a determining factor in this uh, reflux, in this generation of refluxes, as Andal Aus pointed out. What is left from the mother? Where is the 
mother who is calm and quiet, the mother who is sweet, the mother who says, who, who Mariano Ancelotti said, uh, wisely imperfect, or Donald Winnicott says, good enough, or that Aldo Nauri calls uh, properly maternizing. Where are those mothers? We do have right to be mothers that are calm. We have the right to be mothers and professionals, but we have to be calm and serene, mothers that host, mothers that know that life is a gift. It means a surprise. Mothers open to what is unforeseen. Mothers who know that maternity is hospitality without ownership, and also paternity is the same. Mothers that know that having a child is to start losing it from the very first moment it is born. As Sarah knew when God asked the sacrifice of Isaac, not of her child, but sacrifice on the ownership of her child, as Maria with Jesus and Isabel, of course, with St. John. Mothers who know how to find the right balance between presence and absence, attachment and lack of attachment. Mothers that know that the children are their progeny and not their offspring and not their, they, they, not be, they do not belong to her. Mothers who know that they have to be, the, they have to custody their children, but they have to give as a gift the adventure the family belongs, but it's also, they have to leave. And they have to give birth to the children twice, once biologically, giving them the uh, life, but also socially open to them the, the, the world to, of symbols, opening them to the world of culture. Mothers who know that children are alterity, <coughs> transcendence of the purest uh, manner. Mothers who know that the first thing, the, the axis, the reason for their existence doesn't is not to have their children. The reason for their existence has to be her partner. That's the reality. Mothers who know that the freedom of the individual requires a beginning as their own live freedom. Mothers that are not only mothers, mothers 100%, mothers too mothers because they know they have another part, a part that is erotic, a professional part, a personal part that has to be developed. Uh, it has to be developed with the partner and this is with whom we will have to live the rest of our life. We have to, uh, it's very urgent to rehumanize life and to return to the process of filiation to a naturalistic vision of the family. When Dr. Luisiva invited me, well, uh, I was tempted to say no, <laughs> because I didn't know exactly what I, I don't know exactly, not yet, what I know, do here, having listened to the previous lectures. I don't, didn't know what I could contribute to. I don't know if I have been able to add something, but when she, he said that my presentation was on the 24th of September, day of the Virgin of Mercy, I think it was uh, quite interesting because I always wanted to pay homage to my mother, Mercedes, mother of eight children, all not inconvenient, unexpected, or uh, quite uh, difficult, but all very much loved, hosted, and deeply free. Thank you very much. <laughs> Maria, I think that this has not left anybody indifferent. Impressive how in just a few minutes you have been able to uh, really make us move us and give us a vision that is so attractive of the woman in that naturalistic family that we, all of us, frame us in. When you were speaking, there were 1,325 people in the network, and it has started increasing. We want to thank you for the effort of having come to share with us. And as our Congress is a living Congress, we will try to make this lecture viral, not only to the 3,000 people registered, the 1,300 who have listened to you, but to much more people. And just something else, one more uh, gratitude. It's a book from Carlos Soria. The, that in the last years have, has made a study 
of all the trees that exist in the fields that are also a sign of life and that we want to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to my dear students that I see in the last row and whom I appreciate. And thank you, Luis. The parents remind me oh, when I see this book that we have to be the gardeners of our children, not the architects. We plant the seed, and of course, we have to let that our tree grow in that way instead of chiseling the figure. according to what we want from them. Thank you very much.